we are at chapter six and we are almost at the end. We continue from where we left off the last time and that was at verse 37. Arjuna said, one who does not make full effort but maintains faith, his mind slipping away from yoga, thereby not attaining full accomplishment in yoga, what state does he come to, O Krishna? Does he perchance, fallen from both, vanish like a broken up cloud established in nothing? O Krishna, lost on the path of Brahman. Do indeed sunder this doubt in my mind, O Krishna. In its entirety, there is no other who can appropriately be considered a remover of this doubt. So these three verses represent the doubts that a seeker, even a true seeker, has about the practice, the result from that practice, about his own efforts and the doubts about the result from these efforts. I'm sure that all of you may have wondered some point of time or the other, whatever you may be doing, whatever little effort you are putting in, whether this is all wasted time, whether it helps or not, and if you do not accomplish anything eventually out of it and should leave this plane, what becomes of that effort? Is it all wasted? These kind of doubts enter the minds of all seekers without exception. And this is because we lack confidence and trust in our teachers and in ourselves. This doubting, not having seen the result, makes us weaker. Not having had a glimpse of the highest and not understanding where this practice, however little it may be, will lead us, makes us doubt. So this faith, whatever little faith you may have, is very contrived. It requires a lot of effort to keep up with that faith. And then we swing from one to the other. So at times you have a great deal of faith because you have put a lot of energy into that, into believing, into building up that faith. But then again the doubts start creeping in and then the doubts take over. You doubt your teachers, you doubt your practice, you doubt yourself. And this makes you weaker and weaker. And a doubting mind cannot progress. The biggest fear is that when you fall from this path into a life perhaps of busy busyness in our worldly ambitions, if you're lost in this path suddenly, having attained a little something and then again falling, this swinging from here to there does weaken and dissipate our energies. But does it mean you get nothing out of it? These are the doubts that all seekers are having to deal with. 
Arjuna, like all seekers, is seeking a, an assurance from his teacher. And he asks, I have this doubt. What will happen to me if I do not fully attain? In chapter 6, Krishna, Sri Krishna explains and speaks on Dhyana Yoga, meditation. He speaks about the practical aspects. He's, he elaborates and explains in great detail how one can attain a state of Vairagya or detachment. And it's a very practical chapter. And that has led the seeker to get even more doubtful because he realizes that there seems to be a lot to be done, that a great deal of effort is required. And he asks himself, am I up to this? Do I have it in me to go through all this effort? And these doubts weaken him. And he is seeking a, an assurance from Sri Krishna. And if he has full faith and full trust in his teacher, and he believes in his teacher and the guidance, then he will be able to come out of this. Those who do not trust or believe the words of the teacher are lost, are indeed lost on this path. This aspect of doubt is very important because it is this doubt that keeps pulling us down. It weakens our Sankalp Shakti, our determination, our our spirit of determination is weakened by doubt. I'm assuming that there is no further questions in this section because I think this is pretty clear. So what is Shri Krishna's response to this? The Blessed Lord said, O son of Pitha, neither here in this life nor there in the next is there any danger of his perishing. No one who performs blessed deeds at all goes to an evil state, O beloved. Attaining the words of performers of meritorious deeds, dwelling there for long periods, one who has fallen from yoga is born in the homes of pure and glorious people. Or he is born in the family of wise yogis. A birth such as this is very difficult to come, in, to, come to in this world. There he again gains union with the wisdom that came from his previous body. Then he undertakes further endeavor toward full accomplishment, O Prince of Kurus. Because of that previous habit of practicing, he is carried even without his will. Desirous of knowing yoga, he transcends the verbal knowledge of God. Purified of sins, endeavoring, with effort, reaching accomplishment in more than one lifetime, then he attains the supreme state. This is the divine assurance. An assurance from Sri Krishna that whatever effort, however little effort you may put in this lifetime, it is not lost, it is not wasted. Everything you do, however little it may be, is 
counted. This should not be an excuse to do very little or do nothing at all, merely postponing your enlightenment. This is an assurance so that you keep on putting in your effort, your human effort, to whatever extent you can. Creating good deeds, whether it is deeds in the sense of in the worldly sense or meritorious deeds in the sense of practicing meditation and of course attainment which goes beyond good or bad deeds, the uncolored deeds so to say, irrespective of the nature of the deeds, karma is a very brutal law. So whatever you do, it is going with you into your next life. You can see it from that perspective as a brutal law if the deeds are negative. But if they are good deeds, deeds of great merit, then this law of karma works in your favor. It is a bit like accounts that are carried over. Those of you who know a little bit of accounting, if you keep track of money, if um, you come from a business background, then you may be aware that at the end of the year, the financial year, when it ends, the profits or the losses, they are carried over to the next year. And that, in a sense, is exactly what happens to you when you go to your next life. You carry over, the accounts are carried over from this life into the next. If your balance on the karma sheet is positive, you get a, get a good birth, a higher birth. If your karmic balance sheet is negative, you will get a body that is appropriate for living out that karma. So in a sense, it is a very, very fair law, a very just law. And at the same time, you can say, yes, it is unforgiving. You can't just wipe it off the slate. So those who perform meritorious deeds, who develop their character, you take this also to your next life. So none of that what you do for meditation is lost. In a sense, you always continue from where you left off. This is what explains why some yogis, masters, sages, saints unfolded their divine nature very early, at a very young age. Some very well-known historical characters, sages or saints, as well as those of mythological in nature, from stories or legends, have been very young. It's not as if they just got lucky. It's 
not like winning a lottery. It is because they evolved through many lifetimes. And because of the effort they put in previous lives, they got a higher birth, a birth in which they were privileged and these samskaras could be lived out. So it says, even one who has fallen from yoga has not attained and established in, in yoga, but who has attained something but has not been able to remain established in yoga. One who has fallen from yoga is not an evil person. Sometimes when we think of a fallen one, we conjure up an image of somebody who is bad, fallen off the path, is somebody who becomes decadent and materialistic or evil. It is not meant in that sense. It's not judgmental. Fallen from yoga means one who has attained something, who has had glimpses, has had insights, has worked continuously towards it, but has not been able to establish him or herself in that higher state. So, this is indeed an evolved person, but one who could not maintain that height of development. And so such a person is born into the homes of pure, glorious people, prosperous people, or in the home of wise yogis. This is clear that such a birth brings with it great advantages. What you would otherwise have to learn the hard way, <clears throat> going yourself to find out your answers, these things come to you already when you are in the cradle, if I may put it that way. It is like learning a language in your mother's lap. It's very easy. But when you grow up and you try to learn a language, a foreign language, it's very difficult. So also, when you grow up in a family of yogis, you learn a way of life, a yogic approach, a yogic perspective, which makes it simpler for you to unfold these yogic qualities. What does it mean to be in the family of wise yogis? It doesn't mean that you imagine now a little village some, somewhere in a, in a man, uh, you know, in a little loincloth uh, meditating all day. The modern version is a family where there is meditation where there is certain wisdom, where they live a healthy lifestyle, people of character, this is what is meant by pure, glorious people, wise yogis. Such a birth is difficult to come by. It is a privilege reserved for those who have already evolved. This is an assurance, a divine assurance. Having said that, he explains further and says that the wisdom what you attained in the previous lifetime, that's not lost. You gain that same wisdom also in the next life. And then, with that as your base, you endeavor further towards full accomplishment so that you are established in that. 
So it's a evolution through many, many lifetimes. This habit of practicing, when it is developed, is then carried forward, just like the accounts we talked about are carried forward, whether he wants it or not. That's the package. It comes along. So if you have created good habits, these will unfold. If you have created harmful habits, these will unfold. So for those of you who put in even a little effort, this is, this is not lost. This is somewhere. And in the next life, it will come forward. The more effort you put in, the deeper the habit, the, the faster it fructifies. And this is known as fast fructifying karma. Such a person will have a very strong desire and will to attain. And you may ask, where did it come from? And you may find a little child sometimes exhibits great wisdom that even adults don't have. Where does it come from? It comes from a previous life. And so the process goes on over many lifetimes until complete attainment of the Supreme State. So that was the Divine Assurance. Um, would you like to know more about this? Is, are there any questions? Good, I think then we can continue. Verses 46 and 47 are the last verses of chapter 6. The yogi excels the ascetics. He is believed to be greater even than those endowed with knowledge. A yogi is greater than those who perform actions, therefore become a yogi or arjuna. Among all the yogis, he who faithfully devotes himself to me with his inner self entered into me, I consider him the one most united in yoga. Here in these two verses, Sri Krishna sums up the different parts. He says the yogi excels the ascetics and those endowed with knowledge, as well as those who perform actions. Who are these different people or these different parts? The yogi is referring to one who has a systematic method. He's a meditator and has a very systematic method. The one endowed with knowledge is a jani or one who may be engaging in philosophy, in intellectual reading, study, An ascetic is one who is like a, a sannyasi. He may be intent on his goal, but his approach is through renunciation of worldly objects. 
These are tyagi or tapasvi, the practices, austerities. This path of tyaga is not a complete systematic path. The path of knowledge, reading, intellectual study is also not a complete path. It is partial. Mere knowledge cannot lead us to the direct knowledge. The Shiv Sutras, for example, say Janam Bandha. Janam Bandha means knowledge binds. Mostly people are shocked. How can knowledge bind? Indeed, knowledge does bind. It is referring to worldly knowledge, intellectual knowledge. It is not referring to knowledge that is an integrated into one's life. It is not knowledge through direct experience. This kind of knowledge binds us. It is impartial knowledge. It's, sorry, partial knowledge. Who is the one who performs actions? Karma Yoga. You may practice Karma Yoga to the best of your ability. Trying to make your life very skillful and loving. You may put effort in that. But it is also not a systematic path. These verses emphasize a systematic approach. Why is a systematic approach important? Because it is a speedy path. It cuts through everything. It's complete. It considers all the different aspects and using one's will and sharp intellect. Intellect means buddhi. You cut through all the problems, all the issues you may have. You take the shortcut. And therefore, this path is greater than all the others. And of all the yogis, he says, Sri Krishna says, one who devotes himself to me in his inner self, with his inner self entered into me, he is the greatest. This verse has been misunderstood by many to believe that some sort of bhakti is the highest path. Indeed, bhakti is when it is attained with bhava, the, the deep longing and the entire being is surrendering to the highest. But not bhakti as is understood by most people to mean singing songs, performing rituals, reading stories about the life of Krishna and the different gods and goddesses. This form of bhakti may be very inspiring and very useful and very comforting. But this is not referring to that sort of bhakti. The bhakti referred to here has been clearly defined as one who with his inner self enters into me. Who is me? Me is not Sri Krishna. The followers of Sri Krishna, the devotees of Sri Krishna believe that it is a deity saying worship me and you will be the greatest of all my devotees. But from a meditation point of view, we say one whose mind, the inner self is the lower self, the antakarna, 
is well coordinated and with all four well aligned and well coordinated you only are devoted to pure consciousness that one is the greatest of all yogis this one is united truly in yoga so such bhakti is bhava or mahabhava also known as when you attain that level of surrender these two verses are quite controversial for they tend to be comparative and those who are associated with a certain school like to read into this whatever they wish and so they are controversial versus this is the interpretation from the samaya school that is um, a mystical approach it's um, approach where only the knowledge through direct experience is considered to be valid and from that point of view of course this interpretation is uh, could be considered to be uh, yes just another approach it is for everybody to decide whether this this sounds right or not any comments any questions so everyone is very content at this point i'd just like to announce that next week um there will be a time change in europe we always orient to india and so the time will remain constant at 8:30 pm india time so all our online meetings remain uh, orienting to india at the same time but since there's going to be time change um in europe in the us please adjust for this time time change since we still have some time to go we can continue to chapter 7 <clears throat> chapter 7 is called jnana vijnana yoga most of us know what jnana means jnana means knowledge the word jnana is used mostly referring to knowledge in the form of study scriptural study theoretical study intellectual study and not necessarily to mean direct knowledge vijnana however most people do not know what it means and one of the reasons is that vijnana is actually a very broad term like most terms in sanskrit it has many many meanings as you are aware in There are some Sanskrit words that have up to forty different meanings. Vijnana means skill. It means art, proficiency, science, technique, a technology, a method. So, it has a variety of a broad variety of meanings.
In a sense, you can say that jhana and vijjana complete each other. They complement each other. So jhana yoga and vijjana yoga, they come together as jhana vijjana yoga and together they are complete. You can say this is the yoga of knowledge through direct experience or yoga of the absolute in its entirety. It is theory plus practice. It's a complete path. We can use many words to describe jhana vijjana yoga. So this is what the chapter 7 is about. It is a very beautiful, very mystical and poetic chapter. Once again, this chapter has been misunderstood by devotees of Sri Krishna and encourages bhakti in the form of um, devotion to a deity and those who do that miss, miss the higher and deeper meaning behind this chapter. I hope that the next 30 verses I should be able to bring out the deeper meaning behind some of these verses. And while they're very beautiful, very mystical, all uh, of bhakti is indeed very, very mystical. Yet misunderstood very often because in bhakti, when one expresses devotion, in order to express the indescribable or the inexpressible, sublime beauty, we end up using earthly or worldly examples or comparisons. For example, one of the most um, misunderstood form of bhakti is love and separation, Sringar. That means the expression of love between Sri Krishna and Radha was times, at times extremely erotic, immortalized in Indian dance, Indian songs, Indian art. This love was portrayed in a very, very romantic way, in a very erotic way, and was sometimes misunderstood by conservative people. But to express these sublime beauties, there seemed to be no other way. So also this chapter, being a very mystical chapter, sometimes words have their limitations. But we're going to try it. The Blessed Lord said, With your mind attached to me, O son of Pritha, uniting yourself in yoga, depending entirely on me, listen to the way through which you will know me in my entirety, without doubt. I shall teach you knowledge, jhana, together with realization, vichyana, in their entirety knowing which thereafter nothing more remains to be known. Among thousands of human beings, only a few endeavor for perfection. Of those endeavoring, accomplished ones, only a few know me in reality. So the first three verses, very beautiful and very significant. When united in yoga, one knows pure consciousness in entirety. It means you understand consciousness as well as its material reflection. It's like the self is reflected in the universe as the world. 
uh, sorry, the self is reflected in a mirror and appears as the world. So that world is a reflection, it's an illusion, it doesn't really exist. When you look at yourself in the mirror, you see yourself. When pure consciousness, imagine pure consciousness, looking in a mirror. What does one see in the mirror? You see the world illusion. The world is reflected in the mirror. One who is united in yoga sees and knows all this through direct experience. He understands both pure consciousness as well as the world. He understands both duality as well as non-duality. And this knowledge is knowing the highest one in all its entirety. Without doubt. There are no more doubts when you know it. You know tomorrow morning the sun is going to rise. I can try to convince you as much as I want. I can put many doubts in your head. If I'm extremely clever, like some scientists, they have a certain knowledge, a background, as we say, Incomplete knowledge is very dangerous, so with this kind of intellectual, scientific background, you can argue and say, yes, but it's possible that tomorrow morning the sun won't rise. And I'm sure you can conjure up all sorts of disaster scenarios and say, yes, the world will not rise, the uh, sun will not rise tomorrow. But you know it will. There will be people who will argue about it. They will debate and they will discuss and they will put forward scientific studies and a lot of theories and many, many scientific facts as well. And they will try to convince you. But you know it. Why is that? You simply know it. One, you have woken up every morning and the sun had risen. And two, you simply know it's going to rise tomorrow as well. So, there is no doubt there. That kind of determination can only happen when you've had really a direct experience and you're completely established there in that state. And that's the kind of state we are talking about. Knowing that in all its entirety without doubt of any kind without the slightest hint of doubt Sri Krishna says I shall teach you knowledge together with realization so of what use is knowledge on its own without realization together they make they complete each other they complement each other. And once you have these two, knowing that nothing else remains to be known. This echoes, once again, words from the Upanishads. Knowing that all is known. Knowing that nothing else remains to be known. Which is also in the Yoga Sutras. So you see how the scriptures complement each other, confirm each other, and in fact borrow from each other. Imagine you would need to have an operation tomorrow. You have an accident or whatever, and you need to have an operation. Would you like to have a doctor who has never operated before? He has only read books on anatomy but has never operated before. Would you go to such a doctor, such a surgeon? Would you want to be on that operating table with such a surgeon? No, I don't think so. I think that's pretty clear. 
Yet, there are many people who have only theoretical knowledge. They read a lot of books, but have realized nothing. They are very ignorant. And that is not what the Bhagavad Gita is recommending. He says, I will teach you both. We need to do both. Among thousands of beings, only a few will encounter, sorry, will endeavor for perfection. This is a big privilege. There is no doubt that very few people are interested in this. Most people are very busy with their worldly lives, material interests. That's okay. As we have said, it's a process which is taking place over many, many lifetimes. It's an evolution and it is not appropriate to judge anybody. We too are evolving from a perspective of yogis, masters, sages, siddhas, the perfect ones. We too are like little children on the path. So it is not appropriate for us to judge others. But we should know that only very few will make an effort to attain and of these few who endeavor only a very few will know that highest non-dual state in reality. So these three verses clearly recommend a complete path. Not merely an intellectual approach, theoretical approach, but direct experience through sadhana, through practice. So anybody would like to uh, comment, any questions on this? No, everybody happy, everybody content. Good, in that case, we continue. Verses four to seven. Water, fire, air, space, mind, intelligence and ego. This is my primordial nature, Prakriti, divided eightfold. This is my eminent nature, know my other transcendent nature, which has become the souls of jivas, O long-armed one, by which this world is sustained. All the beings have their origination in this. Hold this to be true. I am the origin as well as the dissolution of the entire world. There is nothing at all beyond me, O Arjuna. Everything is woven in me like gems on a thread to form a necklace. Once again, these paragraphs are misunderstood and misinterpreted to mean um, worship of a deity. But you can just imagine if any normal person would say this. There is nothing beyond me. <laughs> or I am the origin as well as the dissolution of the entire world. If any normal human being would say this, 
you'd say this person is an extremely narcissistic personality. He thinks that the world is revolving around him and you just laugh at this person. And indeed, it does sound like that. But remember that these words are spoken by Sri Krishna who identifies with pure consciousness, with the universal self, with the cosmic self. He's not identifying with the lower, with the, with the individual self or with the Jivatman. Many great sages have spoken in this way. Jesus, for example, spoke like this and as a result of which he was crucified for the people said, how dare, this is sacrilege, this is blasphemy, you cannot speak like this. They didn't understand. They didn't understand this. He was identifying with the cosmic self. What does this verse, what do these verses mean? Earth, water, fire, air, space, and mind, intelligence, and ego. Here, the Bhagavad Gita is giving us a theoretical aspect. This chapter is about jhana and the jhana yoga. So first is giving us the jhana part. And in this verse, the tattvas are mentioned. This comes again from Sankhya Yoga as well as Vedanta. And so the first five, earth, water, fire, air, space, are the five elements. It does not go into the details of explaining the... the Indriyas and all these things, these are finer details which are not covered by the Bhagavad Gita, which is considered to be a text for the layman or uh, not necessarily a text that is uh, studied um, more scientifically, such as the Sankhya text or the Yoga Sutra, for example. So this mentions only the first five elements. This is the lowest level of, of material, of the material world. It's the base of the material world. Everything is made out of these three elements, uh, sorry, these five elements. Then it mentions mind, that is manas, intelligence, that is buddhi, and ego, that is ahankara. These are the three aspects of the inner mind or the antakarana. From the perspective of <clears throat> Sankhya, only these three are mentioned as part of the antakarana. From a Vedantic perspective, there is the fourth aspect of chitta, chitta which is also consciousness, but is mentioned here. Um, is, is not mentioned here because this is the Sankhya perspective here and Chitta is strictly speaking everything, everything is Chitta earth, water, fire, air, space, everything is Chitta if you would imagine a blackboard and you're writing on the blackboard the blackboard as well as the chalk in the writing on the blackboard, both would be consciousness. So the elements are like the chalk that write and they create some designs on the blackboard. The mind intelligence are how you perceive it on the blackboard. But all of this is consciousness, including the blackboard itself. And this is the nature of Prakriti or the world. So he says this is one aspect and you should know this. This is my primordial aspect and now there is my transcendent nature and that is the jivas. These are consciousness. 
individual souls, both these are part of me. And so the world is sustained. This play of consciousness is sustained in this way. All these jivas originate from pure consciousness and they dissolve back into pure consciousness. So they originate from there and they dissolve back into it. The entire world dissolves back into it. Pure consciousness is the building blocks of the world and ultimately dissolves back into it. And there is nothing else. There is only pure consciousness. So he says, O oh Arjun, there is nothing beyond this to know. There is only pure consciousness. And the world is this beautiful pattern, says like gems on a, on a thread which form the necklace. So through pure consciousness, the world is created and it's just like a beautiful decoration. It's pretty. When we begin to have a direct experience of this, you get a feel of this, you experience that bhava, and you begin to, these truths, these truths begin to reveal themselves to you in meditation. That knowledge is not a theoretical knowledge, that is direct experience through meditation. So these verses speak about the manifestation of the world. You know that there is an idea about creation, which is a modern idea coming from monotheistic religions. And the cause of the nature of uh, modern life which has borrowed heavily from these uh, monotheistic religions, it, it has come as a part and parcel of modern lifestyle. We, we, we also speak in terms of creation, but in yoga, yoga philosophy, the idea of creation does not exist. The world is cyclical in nature. There is evolution, where pure consciousness moves outwards and materializes or manifests into the world and there is a dissolution where it goes back to its true form, its true nature, it's, that is pure consciousness. And this is the outward moving manifestation, the inward moving, the dissolution. This is known as laya. Laya is like waves. They go out and they move in. Like the waves of the sea. There's this continuous movement in and out. From our perspective, mostly we are going outward. As a soul, a jivatman, you have taken birth. You're moving outwards into the world. You're playing in this world. And those of us who have undertaken to endeavor, to meditate, we want to go inward. So it is a form of dissolution. And that process can be frightening initially for those who start off without knowing exactly what they're doing. I often have said this. Many people talk about enlightenment, but if they would really know what enlightenment means, then they would not want it. And so when 
one starts the process of meditation, what happens is the dissolution of the entire world. It's going backwards to the source. It appears frightening. There is nothing to be frightened about, but it seems frightening to a Hungara that experiences a sense of loss initially. Because Buddha is still not sharp enough. That was verses 4 to 7, quite intense. Uh, go into a great deal of detail. When one completely understands this. That is a, a very, very deep insight. And even if you don't have complete understanding, that's okay. None of this is lost. It all remains somewhere and it all helps us in some way or the other. Any comments, any questions on this? Okay, everybody seems to be very satisfied in this session, so that's nice. Just wanted to repeat once again that next Friday onwards, for those of us living in Europe and the, the Americas where there's time change, please uh, note that you need, you need to adjust for time change. We always orient to India where the time remains constant at 8.30 p.m. Friday evenings. So before we go, I'd like to wish you all a happy Diwali, uh, Diwali Mubarak to everybody. And um, may there be lots of light in your life. And uh, it's also the Hindu New Year, so you carry over your accounts. Hopefully you're going to have a positive karmic balance for next year. Make some good resolutions and then put them into action. Bye, everyone.